welcome back. Um, so hopefully uh, you had a good weekend. I am really looking forward to Canadian Thanksgiving on Monday. Um, I could really use a day off, so I am excited about that. A uh, reminder that the um, proposed hypothesis and pilot study are due on Saturday. So please let me know uh, if you have any questions. Happy to talk over Discord or email or, or schedule a, a video chat. So last time we were uh, starting to get into learning from demonstration. So we had talked about learning from feedback where a person says good or bad. And then I gave a real high level introduction to learning by demonstration. One way of doing learning for demonstration is inverse reinforcement learning, IRL. Has, have any of you come across that before? Um, would anybody be willing to unmute and give a, a quick high level description? I've heard of it, but um, yeah, I think it's when like a human, they demonstrate, uh, I guess, like a policy, and then the agent tries to learn the reward function from that human demonstration. Exactly. Yeah, so think, think about it this way. If, if you had a perfect model of the environment and you assumed what the human was doing was optimal, then you could figure out what reward function is the human maximizing? So typically you, you assume you have a model of the environment and you assume you know exactly what reward features to look at. So if you're trying to learn how to drive a person drives a car, you'd need to tell it things like you know, following distance, um, distance from the middle of the road could be important. Distance from the side of the road could be important. So if you tell it all the things that could be important, then you can do some kind of optimization approach to figure out what the, the human, uh, human's reward is. There are some methods where you do not need a model and IRL is a pretty interesting active area of research. But today I'm actually gonna focus more on apprenticeship learning behavior cloning. So the goal of today is to first talk about learning from demonstration, which typically sees uh, an agent or robot learn to mimic a human. So we, we talked about last time there was this animation where the teacher is moving the, the agents or the robot's arm around, so giving a kinematic demonstration. And then after we talk about basic learning from demonstration, then we'll talk about how it could be used to help reinforcement learning. So don't just try to mimic the human, but also try to improve upon the human. So one, one problem with learning from demonstration is, let's say you've got some expert trajectories. If the expert doesn't really mess up, well, you probably don't expect the ex expert to mess up much, but let's say the expert's really good and al almost never messes up. Then when the agent tries to mimic that human demonstration, at some point it's going to make a mistake. It's going to, because you've got a finite amount of demonstration data, you've got to generalize. And at some point you're going to generalize to an unseen state that the human did not uh, give you a demonstration for. You're gonna try something and it's not gonna be optimal. And you get a little bit off of that path, that garden path, and then you're in trouble. Because, so for instance, if a human was showing you how to drive, if, uh, and then the agent gets a little bit off of where it's supposed to be, if the agent never saw the human's recovery policy, how the human would have gotten back where, the, where it belonged, then the agent's not gonna have much chance because it would have never seen the human try to recover like that. So in 2011, um, Ross and others introduced DAGGER, dataset aggregation, and I really like the idea behind it. So the, the idea is it's an iterative algorithm and it is going to learn a deterministic policy. And what's neat is it's a no regret algorithm. So they can actually, uh, under some reasonable assumptions, they can prove some stuff about it. So uh, it must find a policy with good performance under the distribution of observations it induces in such a sequential setting. So the key thing here is uh, distribution of observations it induces. So to try to get around this, instead of getting demonstrations once and saying, thank you human, 
uh, I'm going off now. Instead, we're going to iteratively request demonstrations. So the main insight is it's going to take this policy that it's learning and get additional demonstrations from the human as it goes. So I wanted to actually show this algorithm. So it's, it's um, it, of course, for me, looking at an algorithm just initially is usually hard. It takes me a few minutes to kind of digest it. But I wanted to put it up here to emphasize it's actually not that complex. So initially, we start and we have no data. And then I'm going to pick some policy in my policy space. So if I'm thinking about a car, car driving policy, I don't know. I'm just going to drive straight. So now I'm going to go and figure out my policy, which is based on, sorry, uh, do, 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 do. so now I'm going to have this beta parameter, which is balancing between pi star and pi i. And shoot, I'm totally blanking on, oh, right. Um, so pi star is going to be our estimate of uh, what the agent is going to do. So let's see. So we've got, what we're going to do is now we, given our current policy, we get some trajectories. And then I'm going to go and for those states I saw, ask the user to tell me how, how they would have acted. So then I can go and take this new data that I get on these new states, combine it with my old data, and now I train the next classifier. So what happens is I have an estimate of my, my classifier. So what I think the human would do, I run it, I collect some more data, some more states, ask the human what the right thing to do was, and then combine that demonstration and use that as the next iteration. So over time, it's going to um, iteratively learn to mimic the expert. And in this way, when the agent makes a mistake, so it comes off of that perfect policy, then it can go and get more data from the human and then learn how to correct for it. And again, this is no regret. So eventually we'll be able to get enough of this data that we learn the near optimal policy. So here, here's an example. They use Super Tux Cart. Um, which you might have seen before, similar to Mario Kart, only free. And here's an example of an expert demonstration. So you can see that the expert is staying on the path. And whereas if you just train on this data, you will quickly fall off the path. So the, the simple way of collecting data is the supervised learning. And you can see that the number of times you fall off the track isn't really improving whereas Dagger is able to very quickly learn not to fall off the track. So this was a cool way of figuring out how to collect new data. Okay, now we see the supervised approach. So now we've just tried to learn a policy that's going to mimic the human. And you saw right there that we quickly, again, fell off the track. So you get a little bit off of the middle and then you get very confused very quickly. Let's see. Um, okay, there we go. Here's smile, where's theirs? Then here's dagger. And what we'll see is it doesn't fall off the track, or at least not very often. So this is one way of learning from demonstration. And you could just take a data set and say, I'm just gonna try to mimic it, or you could try to uh, figure out how to augment that data set and do much better. So that's thinking about let, let's, how can we uh, cleverly collect data. We could also think about other, other modes of interaction. So for instance, let's say you are trying to move a robot's arm around and trying to you know, teach it to pour a bowl of cereal. The problem with this is if, if you are not an expert uh, on this robot, you may not provide optimal trajectories. So in some cases, you might be able to good, give a good tra trajectory. In other cases, maybe it's better to kind of tell the robot where you want it to end up. 
So I'm gonna give an example of this. So for instance, here on the left, you can see a trajectory of the letter P. In the middle is the idea of keyframes. So you can tell the robot, here are important places I want you to get to. And you can see that over on the curved part, it, the robot is just going to interpolate between the points, so you're not gonna get that nice curve. Of course, you could add more points, but then it's harder for the human. So you could also think about a hybrid. So how do we have the robot both uh, use key points, key frames, and trajectories? So, okay, so we could look at these continuous trajectories. And then, well, we could have one way of approaching this is actually have the users say, uh, say something. So like as they're drawing here, they could say, this is, a, this is a point, this is a point, this is a keyframe. Another thing you could do is try to estimate those keyframes from data. Then you cluster them together and you can learn a smoother trajectory. So in this case, in this um, 2012, 2013, 2012 paper, what they were doing is using splines. So to try to minimize jerk. So thinking about making it more smooth, particularly important for robots. And then at each of the keyframes, you could just assume there's zero velocity or acceleration. So saying this is where you want to go. And then you could learn to, to generalize over that. So it's a way of both smoothing these different trajectories because you see that in different states, the human executes different actions because the human is not perfectly, perfectly consistent. Figuring out how to generalize better over those. How can I better figure out what the human was trying to do? One of the interesting things is whether the human is providing keyframes or you're learning them, you have to do this kind of alignment. So figuring out what points belong together. So you do this alignment and then you can do clustering and then you learn to connect the clusters. It was kind of a cool approach, I think. So now let's take a look at what this actually looks like. Okay. So I believe can't remember whether this is AAAI or HCI, but this is an example of getting the robot first into the real world. Um, but more than that, it's with demonstrators who are not necessarily roboticists. So you can hear him saying, go here. That's an example of them, uh, him giving an explicit keyframe. Okay, so he gave a demonstration and now he moved the bowl and asks, can you show me what you learned? <laughs> right, so 
the robot just learned to go and pick up a bowl from a particular or close its hand at a particular position. It did not learn to pick up that bowl. And you'll notice uh, the last demonstration was by uh, Maya Chakmek. I believe that's how I pronounce her name. She's an awesome roboticist at University of Washington. And not surprisingly, she was much faster at teaching and the, the teaching was successful. <laughs> cool. And, that, and that's an example of having uh, two behaviors at once. So having two arms going. So. Learn, learning from demonstration can be a way of, or programming by demonstration, a way uh, often used in robotics for years. There are some commercial uh, robot platforms where that's one of their features that they sell people on saying, look, you don't, excuse me, you don't need to do low level control. You can use this kind of teaching so that not, if, even if you're not a robotics expert, you can still get the robot to do what you want. And that's one of the, one of the hopes of getting robots out into more commercial settings. Great, so question. Um, they're essentially interpolating demonstrations using human give keyframes, right? So there's, there's two things. One is you could have a human give particular keyframes and then the robot figures out how to interpolate between those, or you could use it as a way of summarizing multiple demonstrations. It's more data is almost always better, but if you, if you have little data, then this is one way of really trying to quickly understand what the human's trying to get you to do. And one of the real benefits of working in robotics is that you get cool videos. Robotic videos are always better than, uh, always seem much more fun than when you just show simulation results. Also, you notice that often in robot videos, you have a 2x, a 4x, even a 20x speed, because often current robots are slow, particularly if you want to make sure if you're in a setting where you're close to a human, your robot better not be going too fast, or you have a real, there's a real possibility of actually hurting the person, injuring the person. So we've got a few people typing. Um, and then, oh, great. Um, is it possible to use this human specified trajectory or policy as a starting point for the learning? Yes. And that's, and that's one of, so hold that thought. That is one of the, the ideas that, excuse me, that will leverage in the second half of the class today. Great idea. And then next, I'm going to talk about a different type of learning from demonstration. So here, um, Scott Neekum came and gave a talk at RLAI a few months ago. I, Scott does some awesome work. I believe this, this was from work when, when, his, when he was at UMass as a student. Now he's at UT Austin as a professor. And Scott's interested in, uh, well, one of the things he is interested in is thinking about complex tasks and less structure in the demonstration. But in this, we're gonna look uh, a little bit at um, assembling IKEA furniture. And he's got a lot of cool research on human robot collaboration. Okay, I was stalling because I, I saw someone was typing the question, but now they stopped typing. Oh, now they're typing again. I'll just stall for a little bit more. 
maybe. Okay. So for instance, we could be thinking about learning to interpolate the set of human prescribed joint movements that when a bowl is placed at the right location could appear like learning to make cereal. <laughs> or is that too unfair? So I guess, I think part of this question is about generalization. So if you are just memorizing how to move your joints or uh, how to set your torques, then you're just memorizing and it's really not that interesting because as soon as something bad happens, you, because when, when you try to do that over time, you will make small mistakes and those mistakes add up over time and cumulatively, then you end up in places you don't know how to act. So instead of trying to memorize a trajectory, instead you need to learn things like understanding the human wants me to grab the bowl. So exactly, thinking about um, the, the Rowan mentioned visually grounded learning. So thinking about getting the robot to understand objects and that the human is thinking about this object, not a, a particular uh, position in kinematic uh, multidimensional space. So trying to get the robots to understand those kinds of things are absolutely critical for getting that kind of generalization and real um, uh, more, more applicability. So you, prob you probably know robots have been used, uh, for instance, in um, factories for years and years and years. And the reason they can do that is it's a super controlled environment and these robots are very high precision. They can always put the screw in exactly the same place. And showing a non-roboticist working with the robot is a completely different paradigm because now that bowl is never going to be in the same place twice. And now you've got to try to understand what this human is trying to do. So generalization and understanding and putting together different things is absolutely core artificial intelligence problems. You're right. Nora points out that note the stickers. So it's, it's very common in robotics to have QR codes, uh, sorry, AR codes. So Q, QR codes are those things that you scan with your phone and they go to a website. AR is augmented reality. It's a similar idea. You can, for instance, stick one on the wall and tell the robot, okay, this is position um, X, Y, Z. And then the robot knows that they could wander around and come back. And when they see that Q AR code again, they know exactly what they're seeing. So if, if you don't want to deal so much with the vision problem, then AR codes are one of the ways of making your life much easier. And again, it's completely cheating, but if you're more interested, if you're not interested in the vision part of the pipeline, that makes it more possible. And then uh, Roan's other question is about uh, learning intent. Seems like robots could segment scenes pretty well, but maybe not ha know how to combine objects and for goals. And that's right. And that's, that's I, I believe we're gonna um, see a little bit of that here, where we're thinking a little more about the task level rather than just individual trajectories. So let me play this and then we'll get back to the question. First, the user provides kinesthetic demonstrations of the table assembly task seen here. After eight such demonstrations are collected, they are combined, automatically segmented, and turned into a finite state representation of the task. However, during replay, various contingencies can be encountered. Here, the table leg is too far away for the robot to grasp it at the desired position. The user provides an interactive correction, showing the robot how to grasp it at a closer location, bring it toward itself, and then re-grasp it at the desired location. Here, the robot misses a grasp, and the user provides another interactive correction, showing it how to retry the grasp. Now, the interactive corrections can be automatically segmented and added to the finite state. So this finite state machine, I think, is getting towards what Rowan was saying. So it's a little hard to see, but Scott's going to talk more about it and thinking about how you can solve a task in different ways. So instead of thinking about individual trajectories, think more about the task space. State machine, shown on the right. This additional data allows the robot to recover in novel situations that are similar to the failure seen earlier.
Here, we see another recovery behavior in which the robot recovers from a missed grasp, taking a different path than the finite state machine seen on the right. Finally, we show a full execution of the task from start to finish in which no contingencies are encountered, showing that the interactive corrections have not interfered with the policy in the nominal case. It can be seen that the robot yet again takes a different path through the finite state machine, avoiding the recovery behaviors. All right. In uh, when I teach a robotics class, I often show pictures of robots doing awesome stuff. One of the thing, one of the things you learn when you're doing robotics is you always leave the camera on, and then when you get lucky and all the things align and everything works, that's the video you use during your talk. Even very expensive robots these days, very, very good robots still are not all that robust and things can still go bad, uh, go wrong, especially in unstructured and um, unstructured environments. You've probably heard of Boston Dynamics. They have some amazing robots that do, that do different things. So walking and carrying stuff and a, a little uncharitably, uncharitably, I've heard them referred to as a company that turns videos into DARPA money. So they have these amazing demonstrations and then they go and get lots of, lots of money from the military. It is much more complex than that, but they do have great demonstrations. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in this video mode so that I can actually see people again. That would be nice. Um, share screen this way. Okay. Oh, I think I see some messages in the chat. Um, oh, sorry. So I wasn't, I wasn't, I was looking at the discord, not the chat. Why is the guy holding the robot's hand? Right. So, right. The guy, <laughs> because it's cute. No, the guy, the guy was kinematically directing the robot. Yep. Um, and actually mentioning cute. Um, there is interesting research looking at how the uh, visual appearance of a robot can change people's interaction with it. And there's some really cool research on using robots to try to help socialize kids that are on the spectrum where they can better understand how to interact, interact with other, other people. Hey Matt, can you explain a little more about the state machine here? Is it like a, like a finite size that's always the same for this task or does it get larger or grow during the, the teaching process or, and what is it exactly like representing like possible states that the robot could be in? Exactly. So if I, if I remember right here, you can, uh, this is going to grow and change as you get these demonstrations and corrections. And this was more, so in the, in the previous video, we just saw someone moving the robot around and talking. And here you could see Scott interacting with, a, I think it was a PS3, maybe PS4 controller, because he was doing multiple kinds of things. And then you're right, then they identify these kind of abstract states that the, the robot could be in. So for instance, you could think about, I do not have the bowl in my gripper. I do have the bowl in my gripper. The, gro the bowl is off the table the bowl is at the end position, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's a good point. There's, there's these great videos in Boston Dynamics of people abusing robots. So they have you know, these four-legged robots that are walking around on ice and someone comes up and kicks them and then the robot's able to balance. Just amazing stuff, but it does look a little bit like robot, robot abuse. Okay, so this, this was demonstration. You can think of different ways of trying to figure out how can I mimic the human and do what the human wants. And in this last one, figure out how to recover when something goes wrong. 
But now let's think about incorporating this into reinforcement learning. So one of the, the earlier suggestions was saying, well, let me try to estimate, excuse me, estimate what the human was doing. So let's say I've got a pie uh, and I'm trying to learn what uh, in a state, what action the human would take. Whoops, let me do it this way. So I'm saying um, in a state, what do I think the human would do? So how could you use that to help you in reinforcement learning? Any ideas? Sorry, Matt, can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Um, so it, in Discord, one person was saying, um, is it possible to use this human st specified trajectory or policy as a starting point for the learning? So I'm saying, let's suppose we get some demonstrations and let's say we have this policy that I can estimate from these demonstrations that if the human saw the robot in this state, here's what action the human would make the robot take. So how, how could we use this to help us in RL? Uh, you can probably use it for like action biasing, kind of like the tamer stuff and then decay it over time, assuming that the RL algorithm gets better. Right, so that was one of the, one of the methods in the original tamer pace paper. So you could try to, well, let's execute the action that the human's gonna do more often. What else? Uh, I was gonna say exactly what Reven just said, um, off policy learning, basically just on the trajectory that they have. And because human trajectories like visit um, like hard to reach states, I guess, um, you learn faster because your updates are quicker for those, for the states that you actually care about. Okay, so what, what do you mean by off policy learning? Uh, so like your behavior policy in this case, I guess, is your human demonstration. And then you're trying to learn an optimal policy based on this uh, behavior policy that um, is not the same. Yeah, so um, if you're doing uh, offline or batch RL, one of the things you can do is look at, let's say the human is the behavior policy and I want to learn the best evaluation policy that I can. And then I could deploy that evaluation and learn online. Um, then another suggestion is using the human actions as an eligibility trace if we were doing policy gradient. So maybe, um, Pion, could you talk a little bit more about that? I'm not sure I understand, but I want to. His mic might not be working. Um, so while, while he's typing, are there any other ideas? So we, we've got a few, so, oh, sorry, off policy uh, or batch. Um, other ideas? Um, I guess another idea is you could do, uh, like you said in the beginning of class, inverse RL and try and learn a reward function given the, these demonstrations. And then afterwards train your agent on like maybe like a combination of both this learn reward function and also uh, the ground truth rewards. Yep, uh, we did something like that in 2016. Um, and exactly right that we, we learned a reward from the human and combined that with the environmental reward Sure enough, you can learn faster, especially if the environmental reward is, is sparse or very noisy. So do robots feel simulated pain? That's a uh, very, do, do androids dream of electric sheep? Um, so you, you absolutely could put that in. So for instance, if you, uh, over, if you ex overextend an actuator, if you make a robot act in a way that could harm it, you could have it say, ouch, and you could lower its reward. So you could think about how do I shape or how do I teach the robot not to injure itself? 
I'm not sure if people have actually done that or not. Um, another option is maybe you can just use this uh, policy, like use the greedy action in each state and just bias each of the Q values in the Q table and use that as your initial starting Q table. Yep, so if, I, if I'm going to a state, I could initialize all my Q values to be zero the first time, or I could say, well, I think the human would go up here. So I'm gonna make the Q value for up five and make all the other ones zero. Oh yeah, good idea. So you could also have safety zones. So for instance, if you, if you have a clear separation between the robot and the person and they're in a shared space, but the person doesn't go into the robot space and the robot doesn't go into the person's space, then it's, it's much safer. You could also think about having, having ways of the robot trying to maintain a certain distance or changing the uh, effectors so that if it re meets resistance, it very quickly backs off. So th those are, those are, can be very important things for human robot interaction. Um, also, you could think about if the human is interacting with the robot, trying to understand what makes them uncomfortable. So if the robot gets right up in the person's face and the person kind of backs away from that, maybe that's, that's something you could learn about. So like learning socially appropriate um, uh, distances. Okay, so a few people are still typing, um, but I, I hope this got you thinking about what you might be able to do. There's a lot of different ways you could use human demonstration. So before in Tamer and Coach and the other ones, we were just saying good robot, bad robot. And here we're relying on the, on the human providing more information because in some sense, these trajectories are going to be more informative because there's going to be a, a lot of data that you're gathering through trajectories or points, not just individual good and bad. Okay, so we could have some initial policy and some human actions in each state, calculate the error based on this difference and use these error to build something like eligibility trace vector, which stores the gradient that can minimize the difference between the policy and the human specified trajectory. Okay, so, so trying to say I've got uh, basically doing policy learning, kind of kind of similar to the off policy or batch methods, where I'm going to try to change this policy so that it aligns with what the what I think the human would do. I think that makes sense. So one one of the simple things you could do is take a human demonstration and say, well, I'm going to take all these states and actions, the humans, with the, the agent was in the hit state and the human made that agent take an action. So this could be through teleoperation, this could be through um, kinematic manipulation, or it could be with a computer program. And then I'm going to summarize that policy. So I, I get a classifier that says, um, some kind of classifier that says for a state, I'm gonna guess what action the human would take. And we could do a neural network, an SVM, a decision tree. In this case, we used a decision list. So this is just a bunch of if else clauses that's human readable. But whatever the classifier is, you can take that and then use it to bias the agent like Vlad was suggesting. So for instance, we know in normal epsilon greedy learning in RL, you balance exploration and exploitation. So some probability you try something random with some tr probability you do what you think is best. Here, we have another probability, which is the agent will execute the action it thinks the human would take. So if this classifier was perfect, then you could perfectly mimic the human in every state. But since it's a finite data set, it won't be perfect. And further, you, here we don't just want to mimic the, per the person, we actually want to use reinforcement learning to outperform the person. So in this case, if the human gives us a suboptimal policy, over time, we are going to use it less and less, and we will rely on our own Q values and learn where the person was not perfect. So one example of this 
is in keep away. So here you've got three keepers in red, two takers in blue. The keepers are trying to maintain possession of the ball. The blue, blue ones are trying to take it over or kick it out of bounds. And the human can demonstrate this policy. The game moves at a reasonable clip. It's, it's, I won't say it's not that hard, but it's not easy either. It's kind of intermediate. So the human needs, controls the agent with the ball and the human can choose to either maintain possession of it or pass to one of the two, two teammates. So there's three actions the human's choosing between. And you notice we can make this easier or harder by changing the speed of the game. So the humans, humans recording all of these actions, we keep track of the actions the human takes in different states, we summarize the policy, and then we can use this for autonomous learning, trading off exploiting or executing our, the classifier we think the human would take and trading off our own exploration and exploitation. Uh, then there's a question, could this be used to encourage exploration? The human could give demonstrations of where the agent should explore initially and eventual exploration bias will decay. Cool idea. So um, your thing, one thing you might use this for is trying to get the agent into interesting parts of the state space. So for instance, you could get it to that treasure chest or think about you could, uh, Last class, we were talking about throwing the robot off the cliff. In this case, you could give a demonstration where you go off the cliff and show the agent that, wow, this is really bad. You shouldn't do this again. So I, th I think that makes sense. Okay, so here's a learning curve. We've got uh, our method in orange and learning from scratch in red. And they start off very similar. There's a slight improvement at the end. If you look at the area under the curve, the orange is slightly better. But if you're gonna be uncharitable, you could say, well, Matt, okay, I see one line is above another. Uh, good job. I'm not sure that's actually interesting or significant. So one of the things you can think about though, in, in, in these type of speed up methods, I've got my base RL algorithm and I'm trying to make, make it better. And one way you could measure that is to say, I really want, oh, um, I really want my agent to reach a performance of 14. I want, in this case, I want my, my um, robot soccer team to be able to maintain possession of the ball for 14 seconds on average. If I use normal, um, normal reinforcement learning, it takes around 14 hours. If I use demonstrations, it takes around eight hours. So that's a pretty significant performance. Eight, for, eight versus 14 hours, not, not quite half the time. But the cool thing is that we were, doing, we were doing this kind of improvement with only three minutes of human training time and suboptimal, suboptimal demonstrations. So the idea is that reinforcement learning, especially initially, can be really bad. And even if you don't have optimal demonstrations, it's so much better than nothing. Getting that small amount of bias can help you learn so much faster. And we, we see this consistently. If you have a better demonstration, a higher quality demonstration, it can often help you more. But even if you have a, a poor demonstration, so you turn, you turn the simulator speed up twice or three times, the human is still doing better than random. And even bad demonstrations can make a huge improvement to, to training. Okay, so this was the human agent transfer algorithm, HAT. When, when you invent a new algorithm, it, I, I'd like to come up with a nice backronym instead of saying my algorithm, actually calling it HAT so people can remember. Um, so this was the HAT algorithm. And then a few years later, we introduced the CHAT algorithm where you have confidence HAT. And I won't go into many of the details here, but the, the main thing is that we said, instead of learning a classifier, Let's learn a classifier and confidence. So when we get a human demonstration, we will not see all states, continuous uh, setting. We, we never, in general, never see the same state twice, but there could be some parts of the state space that the human never gets to. And if the agent is going to be following the human advice in an area that it never really saw demonstrations, that doesn't necessarily make sense. So what we could do is 
use different methods. So for instance, we could use a neural network and have the softmax layer uh, indicate the confidence. So if I have four output nodes for the value or saying whether to go up, down, left, right, if left is 0.99 and all the other ones have, have small values, that's high confidence. Whereas if all four of the nodes had 0.25, that would be a measure of very low confidence. But whatever function approximator we're using, we can go back, do the same thing, similar thing as before, but now only execute if the confidence is above some threshold. So relatively simple change. So now, now you've got another hyperparameter you have to tune, but you can say, well, if, if, if I'm not 90% confident, I'm not gonna bother trying to follow the human here. It's just not worth it. And you can trade this off. So if you have a very high confidence level, then you don't use advice very often. You don't try to mimic the human very often, but it's usually very similar to what the human would do. If the threshold is low, then you get more times where you try to mimic the human, but now you're taking more guesses. So the where you are biasing the agent may not be as good. Vlad? Uh, yeah, so in the original hat paper, the, the first one you're talking about, um, does the amount of times you use the human's actions decay? Is that what you were saying earlier? Oh yeah, sorry. So right, with, with some probability, may, maybe with probability one, you initially force the agent to follow what it thinks the human would do, and then you decay that over time. So eventually you, you don't even have access to this uh, classifier anymore, and you, you're forced to rely on your own, your own knowledge. Okay, now it's weighed by a con. Well, it's 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 a hard cutoff based on the confidence as well. Now, that's right. Okay, thanks. So, yep, it's the same kind of decaying. Just now, you're only only ever execute if it's above some threshold. And we can show a learning curve showing it works. Um, one of the open questions is these these were two ways of leveraging demonstrations: hat and chat when is one going to outperform the other? Seems like chat in general seems to be better than hat, but there's a lot of these methods. Why, if I've got a demonstration, which one do I choose? How do I know which of these ways of leveraging a demonstration I should use? Does it depend on the quality of demonstration, the, the amount of demonstration, the difficulty of the task? There, there's a bunch of open questions in terms of trying to understand in this setting, here's the algorithm I should use. So those were two fairly simple ways of looking at combining demonstrations with a reinforcement learning agent. Then I wanted to talk, instead of a demonstration, we, well, we could have a person say good or bad. We could also have a person, instead of giving a demonstration, we could have a person interject or, or another agent interject and say, hey, you, go right. Instead of saying that was good or that was bad, you could give an actual action suggestion. So one way to think about this is to think, I've got a student that's interacting with the environment. And okay, it's got a state action. It, it's in a state, it takes an action, gets a reward. But I've also got this teacher. And the teacher knows more than me. And let's assume that I can only bug the teacher so many times. So there's some kind of budget where once I use that budget up, the teacher's no longer going to talk to me. So you might think, well, I could use everything at the beginning. I, I'm going to use up my entire budget at the beginning because I'm so bad. Or you might think, well, I want to be very careful about when I use this budget. I want to think about where it will be most impactful. So we started with this paradigm and, and started trying to come up with ways of heuristically deciding when the teacher should intervene and give some advice. We assumed that the student would always execute that advice fa uh, faithfully. As a teacher, I can tell you this is not true in practice, but let's assume it is. And the, the other thing is the, we assume the teacher is suboptimal. So the teacher gives us advice, but eventually you're gonna run out of budget, stop listening to the teacher, and then you're going to improve over it. That's the hope. So here's the setting, we're in Mario. 
episodes last for some number of steps, 2,000 steps. Um, you've got 500 episodes. So there's a total of up to 2,000 times 500 actions. And you can ask for help a thousand times. So asking for help is relatively rare. But even then, getting a human to ask, answer a thousand things, that's going to be tough. You might need to do some crowdsourcing and get it multiple people. But let's think about how the teacher could allocate this budget to help the student. So the first idea is early advising. I am just going, the teacher is going to use up those a thousand pieces of advice on the very first episode. And then it's gonna, then it can walk away. So, okay, that's, that's a fine baseline. Uh, one thing people have done in the past was look, think about how many times has, has the student visited this state? So if you're in a discrete setting, you could say, the first time I visit a state, I'm going to ask for advice and then never again. And if I had the same amount of advice as number of states, I could perfectly learn the, to mimic the human's policy. In a continuous space, that's a little bit harder. But another thing, what we were trying to do is think about, okay, what does it mean for a state to be important? That, that's not really well defined, but if, if we knew, okay, this is an important state, or this is, we think this is going to be an impactful state for the student, that's when I'd want to give my advice. So one heuristic for this is this importance metric. So the teacher has its learned Q values, and the teacher looks at the student's current state and says, what's the best thing the student could do versus what's the worst thing the student could do. So for instance, if taking the right decision here will keep you from dying, that's much more important than if you had three actions that eh, one's a little bit better than another, but it's not hugely important. So there were, there were later methods, which, and there are contemporary methods, which try to learn when to teach, but this is the, the very simple approach of just coming up with this, uh, with a heuristic and showing it, it is capable of teaching effectively. So, okay, so we could, we could hand code this importance metric and decide to only teach when it's, when it's important enough a state. We could also cheat and say, well, let's have the student broadcast its intent. Hey, teacher, I'm gonna go right. Then the teacher could say, is this important? And how bad is going right? And I could use, the teacher could use that information. Don't give up some of your budget if the student's already gonna do the right thing. But originally we were assuming this was one way communication. So this is kind of cheating and it's, it's not gonna work very well in real time. What you could do is use simple modeling. Let the teacher estimate the student's current policy. Oh, learning from demonstration. Um, you estimate the student's current policy. If the student is in a state that the teacher thinks is important, and if the teacher thinks the student is going to do something stupid, then it will use some of its budget. So these were um, one simple baseline and three different heuristics we used. And sure enough, they worked. So we can see using no advice in blue, early advising helps dumping out all your advice at the beginning. Importance advising improves on that. So the green line is slightly above the red line. Uh, so instead of just dumping everything out at the beginning, figuring out how to use it better. And then predictive advising, where the student, uh, sorry, mistake correcting, where the student announces, and predictive advising, where the teacher models the student actually perform about the same. Yes, and David asks, what's the deal with the dip? Um, and that is something that we, we saw a bunch of times. And you end up saying, yes, that's a very interesting phenomenon for future work. And to date, we haven't really identified. So I, should, I, I shouldn't be too glib. So in transfer learning, getting this U-curve is not uncommon, where you transfer something, you do really well, and then you kind of start unlearning because you're exploring more of the state space. And my, my, ex, my, my explanation was always going back to the dagger idea that now 
okay, the, the student is off the really good path and it's exploring and doing all this exploration to try to figure out, oh, and then, yeah, okay, I, what I learned before really was good. Uh, it's not on this graph, but I want to say the teacher had a performance of somewhere around here. I, I, I know, I can't remember if it's this graph or another result, but it, at least some of the results, the teacher is much worse than what the student was able to eventually achieve. The student's teen phase, yes. Oh my gosh, I'm not looking forward to that. Um, my, my daughter is very strong-willed already, and she's five. Black? I have a question. For the predictive advising part, when you model the student's um, behavior, how, at the beginning, don't you have very little behavior to learn from, so your model of the student is terrible as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 that was a surprising result. So we used an SVM over the last five episodes, and this classifier, I want to say it was, it was like 75 or 80% accurate, um, which sounds, which is not bad for four actions. It's definitely not random. It's not great. So it's kind of surprising the predictive advising did as well as the mistake correcting. It seems like just having some guess at the student's performance does help you conserve that advice for when it's going to be most useful. And the, the mistake correcting, I, I forget from the last slide, that's the one where the student can tell you what it's going to do? That's right. It says, hey, teacher, I'm going to go up. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, I'm going up. That seems crazy that they would do the same if one of them is just predicting essentially what the mistake correcting as is ground truth already. Yeah, so actually, now that you bring that up, one thing we could, could have done is really looked at making those predictions better and worse and seeing how that in, impacted the method. Because if the prediction was random, then it better not help relative to importance advising. Uh, but this was a AMOS 13 paper and it was, look, our method works, thank you for the paper. Um, try, uh, since then, a number of people have done much, much more sophisticated, much more sophi sophisticated things. So this was, this was a teaching um, example. And in this case, we used a teaching agent, but you could, you could think of a teaching person maybe, uh, if, you, if you had many, many, a much smaller budget. But we also looked at trying to crowdsource to identify errors. So we told people a little bit about Pac-Man and then we wanted them to help show where the agent made a mistake. So we recorded 10 different videos and, ident and purposefully, let's see, let me back up. We re-recorded a ton of videos. And in those videos, it was not an agent acting, it was a grad student. And that student was making suboptimal decisions. We selected 10 of these videos that had more or less subtle mistakes or suboptimal actions and then asked people to help identify them. And there were actually four different settings. So first you could think of I'm asking someone to identify a mistake as the video is going. You could also give them a slider where they could bring the video forward and backward. Here's where you made the mistake. So it could either be real time or let the person review, review the video, go forward and backwards. You could also say, instead of just identifying a mistake, you could also say that you made a mistake here, you should have gone up. So this is analogous to, um, well, if it was real time, it would be analogous to the teacher yelling out directions. If it was review, this could be going back in time and saying, oh man, you should have gone up here. You, you messed up. And it turns out that people were able to do this pretty well. So we, we looked at real time and review. We're trying to just identify a mistake. And in review, they do quite well. There's a few places where they kind of anticipate the mistake and um, then anticipate the mistake. And most of the time they really do do a good job of zooming in. If it's real time, there are some misfires where people just get antsy. 
And then if they've waited around that long, they do do a, a decent job of identifying the mistake. So it seems like um, humans, humans can do this. We didn't, if I remember right, we didn't see a huge difference in terms of the action suggestion. So for instance, here's um, the, the four different videos and the optimal action was uh, down in three cases and up in the fourth. So in the first case, we see people did a good job of identifying the right action, correct action. In the second case, a little more than, than average. Third case did better. And then finally, they do a good job on this, on this one. So it seems like humans might be able to, to give you good advice. I was kind of hoping we'd see some cool, cool interaction where if a human was giving advice and not just identifying a mistake, that they were better at identifying the mistake. So trying to think if, if the human was more engaged and had to think about, man, what, what is optimal? That somehow that would make them better at saying here was the problem. Turns out that wasn't the case. But that's science. So there was some preliminary work on getting the crowd to, uh, to do this identifying mistakes and mistake correction. We never ended up closing the loop and showing that from these, you could actually improve training. So this took a long time to get these 10 videos and get you know 30, 30 or so suggestions for these 10 videos. We were talking before about a thousand pieces of advice. So we would need to, need to either significantly increase the scale of this kind of study, or we would need to have a method that's much more uh, efficient in terms of the amount of advice it asks for. Okay, so this was, we were saying the, so far the, the teacher has been providing help in this, in this last one, we were saying, well, the teacher's identifying where mistakes are. And the teacher actually knows what's going on, right? We're assuming that the teacher is more informed than the student, at least initially, but the student knows what's going on in his head, right? So there could be cases where going back to the visit count. So for instance, if the student says, wow, I've never been here before. I have no idea what to do. That could be a good time for the student to ask for help. And there was some nice work by Ofer Amir and others at, uh, during her internship at Microsoft Research where they did uh, both ways. The student could ask for help and the teacher could proactively provide help. So that was another heuristic method that could think about where, where, uh, who is triggering this interaction. One of the things I'm really excited about right now, Britt is doing a master's thesis where she's looking at explainability for RL. And you could think about, let's say I have two agents. I don't see the score, but I could see explanations maybe an explanation would help me decide which agent is better in terms of the reward, the hidden reward. An explanation could probably help me predict how an agent would act, I, I hope. Most relevant here is what if an explanation could help you provide better advice? So if Pac-Man is doing the right thing for the wrong reason, you won't be able to know that unless you've got some kind of model of how the agent is reasoning. So that's, that's ongoing. One other thing I'll note about explainability is there's a significant amount of research which um, says, here's an explanation and a human looks at it and says, yeah, that makes sense. That's not a great metric. Um, so one of the things we were talking about doing is what if we showed, just messing with people, showed absolutely fake explanations. So for instance, um, there's this great example in Breakout where they use a saliency map to say, well, the agent is making its decisions based on the paddle location and the ball. Oh, but it's also got some attention up here. And that's because it's strategizing about how to bounce the ball up there and then bounce around the ceiling a lot. So it gets lots of points. That is completely reasonable explanation. No idea if it's true. So it's, it's kind of interesting thinking about can, not, not only can explanations be useful, um, but if, if an explanation is not quantitatively useful, if, and if humans can't actually tell if it's correct or not, it may not actually be that, that, that important. If you are trying to sell an application, 
and you have some explainability tacked onto it, that could be a sales point, regardless of how accurate it is, which is a little scary. So, oh, um, doing some research on what type of help should be preferred. So we could think about, well, the user, it's easier for the user to give advice versus the demonstration. Or the user is not very good at Pac-Man. We do not want a demonstration from them. But in addition to a total budget, oh, sorry. That, so we've just been talking about a total budget. Another thing you could do is having a student request advice when it was uncertain. So we hinted at this before. But one simple way of measuring uncertainty is to use an ensemble of Q values. So let's suppose we've got a, a, a number of different, in, in the extreme case, a number of different neural networks. And we could look at the disagreement between the different neural networks. If one network thinks the best thing is to go up and another one thinks the best thing is to go to the right, or one thinks the Q value for up is 10 and the other thinks the Q value for up is uh, 105, that could be a good time to ask for help. So very simple heuristic, but it made significant improvements. So there's, there's a, a lot of open work possible in this area. But let's think about getting away from a budget into an actual cost. So let's say I could pay someone to give me a demonstration, or I could pay someone five cents every time they gave me an action suggestion. How could I figure out when it was useful? Again, there are some heuristic methods. But one of the things we're working on now is let's take a step back and look at a multi arm bandit setting. Let's suppose there's a teacher that can give me the correct payout for one arm at some cost. So I could either pull an arm that has the highest payoff in the long term, or I could ask for help. So if the advice was free, I would ask for help on every step. If advice was super expensive, I wouldn't. But somewhere in between, there's something, there could be something really interesting happening. And if the t what if you were trying to learn Pac-Man, so the student is trying to maximize reward, and you have to pay the teacher in dollars? Now you've got a potentially interesting multi-objective problem, where how do I figure out the sweet spot where I'm trading off maybe the probability of my paper getting accepted with how much of my research budget I'm blowing through. And this comes back to the idea of value of information. So if you had, if the setting was small enough, you could do the whole Bayesian update. You could say, okay, this is, these are my priors for the different payoff, arm payoffs. And I could think about if I asked the Oracle about this arm, what is the expected improvement to my long-term payoff? And is that expected improvement higher or lower than what I have to pay them? So in the simplest case, this is the last poll. I've got the, ar I've got the, uh, the arm that I think is best and I'm going to pull that. So I could either pull that arm or I could pay the Oracle to tell me about one other arm, maybe this arm or a different one. And I could figure out how likely is it that the Oracle's information would change what I would do and what would that change, what would the difference in my payoff be? Because it could be that, oh, I go from arm one to arm two and that ends up on an expectation increasing my score by five. So if I only have to pay the teacher four, it's worth it. In general, you're not gonna be able to do this because you're gonna get overwhelmed and you've gotta come up with some approximation, but at least in the simple case, we're hoping, we're hoping we can come up with the right answer. But trying to go and really understand exactly when to ask for help is also gonna depend a lot on how good the teacher is. So you could have a teacher that gives you the correct payoff 90% of the time or maybe it has a 95% confidence interval around the correct payoff, or you, you can go on and, and you can think, well, maybe one teacher is more expensive. One teacher is 100% right, but charges me 10. Another teacher is 99% right, but charges me one. Maybe I should use that not perfect teacher. So I saw someone unmuted before I cut them off. Do you want to top it? Nope. I, oh, 
I, I guess I, I just was kind of like from how you're describing this problem, is, is it kind of like a bandits problem within a bandits problem? Because you have to now have it like you have the bandits problem you care about, and now you have this internal bandits problem of trying to weigh. I don't know. It just kind of seems, from my perspective, you could almost just rewrite it as just like a single bandits problem where the teacher is just part of the original problem. But nice. Yeah. I don't know. Like, so the one the one difference here is I I think it really is a multi level because you have to decide do I ask the teacher for for help or not. Then if you don't ask for help, then you need to decide which arm do I pull. If you do ask for help you incorporate that information and decide which arm to pull. Because the, the, weird, the, the slightly weird thing here is when I pull an arm, I am getting extra information about that arm. So I can learn about an arm by asking a teacher. I can also learn an arm by pulling it myself. So you are, it's, it's kind of a, a different level of exploration. But particularly if you had multiple teachers, then it's, it's more clearly a, a two-level problem where you say, do I pull an arm or do I ask for help or not? If I do ask for help, which of these teachers do I ask? And then what, whether I, once I get that information or don't, then which of these arms do I pull? Does, does that make sense? Or do you still want to argue that you might be able to just incorporate it? I, I think I get what you're saying and maybe the nuance of it is where like the beauty of it is. Um, but I guess when, just to clarify, when you say exact payoff, are you talking like the teacher would have told you, okay, this is the sample you're going to get if you had pulled this arm or like, it'll tell you this is the expected value of it. Cause yep. I feel like if it told you the expected value, then you never need to explore that arm again. But I don't know if that's an important aspect of the problem if I was not paying yeah. attention. No, no, that's interesting. So there's actually three things you could think of. One would be student. If you pull arm one, you're going to get a five. It could also be, student arm one always has a payout of five or you could say student arm one has a distribution of payoffs like this here's the actual expectation so if you're given the actual expectation or distribution of payoffs or if you've told or if you're told arm one is deterministic and here's what you always get I, you're right you you will not need to ever explore that again you might pull it because you're exploiting but you wouldn't need to explore but if, if the teacher just told you the next time you pull arm one, you will get a five, it could be that it's actually a really horrible arm and you're just going to get really lucky on the next pull. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. So this was the last slide on Thursday, we're talking with AI Refined, and they're going to be talking about um, different kinds of human agent interaction and ways humans could help. So hopefully, the last kind of three lectures where we've been talking about different ways of humans interacting and how you might have multiple humans or even multiple students, uh, hopefully that will prepare us uh, well for that. Um, other questions or comments? before we wrap this up. All right. Um, well, as you could probably tell, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this area of research. I am very excited about the hippo gym that we're gonna be releasing because that will let us run lots of experiments with real people where we can start to get a, get a handle on these ideas rather than having just uh, teachers that are agents. So my hope is that when I teach this class again in a year or two, I'll have significant, significantly more I can say about when to use one method or another, or how to figure out using value of information, which teacher to ask. But since it's research, in two years from now, I might be using exactly the same slides. So cross your fingers for me, hope that's not the case. All right, with that, I'm going to stop recording and streaming, but as always, you are welcome to stick around.